So I was asked to speak on neo-republicanism and neoliberalism. I might even get a word in about neo-populism at a certain stage. And uh, I was asked to do a public lecture because there are many people here who aren't uh, part of the conference. So I'm afraid those who are may have to bear with hearing some, uh, some rather jaded truths. I still think they're truths, uh, but forgive me if I bore you to some extent. So what I'm going to do, as I thought about it, to introduce the two approaches and set them in contrast, is to start with some history, uh, inevitably potted history. I mean, it's very simplified and uh, I'm awfully conscious when I see various people around the audience, like Jean Fabien Spitz there, for example, that there are people who know an awful lot more about my history than I do. So it is well a simplified version. But the point of it is to bring up the contrast, as I see, between these, between these two approaches. So let me just begin with the, I'll go through briefly, what I see as the origins of the classical Republican approach to politics, and then the development of the classical liberal view in response to that approach in the 18th century. And then I'm going to represent neo-republicanism and neoliberalism respectively as modern equivalents, so to speak, updatings of those two traditional approaches. I think it's quite important to have a sense of the history and the background to each in order actually to understand what each represents as a philosophy of the state. So I'm going to begin not with Athens, so I think Athens, we have a paper about that today, uh, Athens had obviously contributed a lot of the ideas, a great part. But the Republican tradition, standardly, and I tend to trace it to classical Rome, to the Roman Republic, and in particular to Polybius. You remember it was a, a, um, a Greek hostage who spends 10 years or so in Rome as hostage and then stays on and writes the great history of Rome and tells the Romans, like the Tocqueville told the Americans, are indeed Montesquieu told the British, he said, you guys are just terrific. You've got a great system here, let me tell you what the system is. And as he represents it, and now I am simplifying, and as it comes to be represented by those he deeply influences, like Cicero and Livy and so on, and you get the following, and let me give a very idealized picture of Rome, but the picture is this. And I do have a handout because I want it to go faster than it really should. So you can at least see where I am. And there are actually even some references on the last page for those of you who are interested in chasing up some of these things. But in this Roman way of thinking, as I think, as I reconstructed, uh, the law is right at the center. And the law does a number of things. First of all, it defines for every citizen. Now, of course, women were not citizens in, um, in the Roman Republic. Nor were lots of foreigners, nor were, of course, slaves of all. And uh, I'm just going to abstract from that in the later discussion. I'm going to talk about citizens. Of course, in neo republicanism, citizenship is extended to all the, well, I would say, the more or less permanent, adult, able minded members of the society, at least. The citizens under the law in ancient Rome would have seen themselves as protected by that law in the same range of choices as everybody else. So the first thing that the law did was give, so to speak, a width, a breadth, to find the range of choices in which, as a Roman citizen, you could expect to enjoy the protection of the law against any other individual or any group of individuals who would intrude on those choices, idealized for sure. But that is the first dimension of what the law does. It establishes the range of choices, and they will later come to be called in the tradition, certainly in the, already in the 17th century, they're called the basic liberties. They're choices such that everyone can enjoy them at the same time as everybody else. And of course, they're defined differently under different legal systems, fitting different cultures, different technologies, and so on. But the, that's the first thing the law does for the citizen, to find the range of choices in which he or she, he has to be, can expect to be protected against others. The second thing it does, of course, is define the level of protection that's available. Not only does it define the range of the basic liberties, it establishes 
the protections that are deemed to be sufficient to protect a citizen against intrusion by other people. Now, we'll come later to the issue of how high, so to speak, the fences should be, but I want to insist on these two dimensions. There's a range of choices in which you're free, and then there's the height of the protection, the height of the walls, so to speak, that protects you against intrusion in the exercise of those choices. And those two things wrap into one um, in giving uh, each citizen um, a sphere, as you might say, of personal, well, to use a later word, it was not their word, a sphere of personal sovereignty. It was a sphere within which each citizen, in a phrase from the Roman law, you get it in Justinian's code, in which each citizen was sui iuris, of himself, sorry, of his own jurisdiction, so to speak. Within this sphere, each citizen really was, as we would say, his or her, his or her own man or woman, his or her own person. That's a fundamental sort of idea. That was actually in the Greek tradition, arguably, as well, but it really got emphasized in the Roman tradition. Why? Because they emphasized that every kivas, every citizen, in virtue of the law that protected that citizen, was also a leaver, meaning a free man, as it got to be translated into English later, a free person. And freedom for them was essentially a property of the person, and it was the property of the person in the first place as a result of their enjoying status within the law that gave them a range of choices and protected that range of choices adequately against others. Second problem though, once you've established with the law this range and this protection of basic liberties, you've still got the problem about who's in charge of the law. And in the Roman way of thinking, if the law was laid down by someone who was in charge of the law and could change the law just as he or she willed, and they thought, of course, of the king, the traditional king, understood as a more or less absolute power in the land, they thought of the king as being absolutely anathema. Because if you had a king ruling, determining the law, even a law that perhaps done very well in protecting people, still everybody would depend on that king would depend on the will of that king for how well the law treated them. He could change it after all at his will, meaning they were dependent on his will. And the Roman response to that was to say that, and Polybius in particular emphasizes this, was to say that the people themselves have to exercise sufficient control over the making of law to mean that when the laws uh, determine the range of their basic liberties and the degree of their protection, that law answers to what the citizenry in generally, to the terms that they would think are reasonable. We'll again come back to that idea, but that's roughly the idea. Now, the libertas in this sense, a two-dimensional freedom, a freedom against other people in virtue of the law protecting you, a freedom looking upwards, so to speak, vertically rather, horizontally, against the government, against the state that made the law, insofar as we the people, sharing equally with others, exercise control over the law that actually determines. They contrasted libertas in that two-dimensional sense with dominatio, which is what they thought that the servants necessarily suffered as a result of having a dominus, a service, in particular a slave, as far as a slave had a master or a dominus, the slave depended on the will of the master as to what he or she could do in any range of choice. And so they contrasted freedom, the freedom of the kivas, the citizen, with the, well as we even said in English, the servitude, the subjection, the dominatio, they call it, and that's why I like the word domination, with the domination uh, that someone uh, suffers insofar as they've got a boss in their lives. One feature of this emphasis in the Roman tradition, which Quintus Skinner draws attention to um, in one of his books, is that, for example, in the a comedy by Plautus, the Roman comedian, he has a slave, Tranio, come to the front of the stage at some point in the play and explain to the audience the 
Roman audience, explained to them that because his master was actually rather nice and was away a lot of the time, and when he wasn't nice or gentle, he was at least gullible, he, Tranio, could get him to do anything, that he actually was freer than any citizen. And as Quentin points out in my commentary, this would have been just a joke in Rome. I mean, it was a comedy, right? So anyone who thinks he's free because he can act as he wish, but just because he's lucky, because he's got a gentle master, a kindly master, that's, a, that's silly. For them, being free, having the freedom of the person, requires these two things, a law that protects you and a law over which you exercise equal control with others. So you have to be a non-dominated person because of the law, subject to a non-dominating law. And the whole structure of the mixed constitution in Rome, that Polybius in particular lords and celebrates, is, is designed, as he thinks so, to give people the control over the law. That means they will not be dominated. This means there are two ways in which you can be dominated in the Roman view. One is by means of being, of course, a slave, and that would include being a woman, uh, being subject to the will of anybody else, even somebody who is very, very nice to you, who really had your interests at heart, because that person might change their will, and so you depended on their will remaining a good will in order to enjoy your, your, your freedom of choice. And the other way in which you can be unfree is to belong to a society where even if the law protected you, it was subject to the say-so, subject to the will of either an individual or an elite who could change the law at their own will without consulting the people as a whole. So it's a very simple structural idea. Now that idea, of course, it was what I've told you is idealized, known in, in Rome, apart from the very elite, really enjoyed that degree of either vertical protection or horizontal control over the law that protected them. As we know, for example, all the senators would have had hangers-on, clients, they were called, and certainly those clients would have depended on the goodwill of the people whom they were clients. But the idea was a sort of electric idea that I think, while it disappears, at least in realization, and any sort of realization under the empire, the idea remains live, and it's still alive in the Code of Roman Law, as it's codified under Justinian in 550 AD. Let's put aside, turn our backs on the Dark Ages, but when you move to about 1200, 1300, in particular northern Italy, you're suddenly finding cities that are very independent. They become great trading centers, like Venice, of course, or Florence, or Siena, and so on. And these cities quickly, partly as the Renaissance approaches, as a result of now reading the classical texts again, partly as a result of tradition, they conceive of themselves as republics in the Roman mode. And so you get these same ideas um, coming up again and again. One, that the individual citizen is a leaver enjoys freedom insofar as he, in principle she, but insofar as he is adequately protected, meaning protected across a suitable range of choice, the basic liberties as they be called, and protected to an adequate degree. The width and the height of the protection is okay, and the law that confers it is subject to those people considered as equals under one or another constitutional form, but it, as a matter of fact, in most of these cities, the constitutional form is roughly a mixed constitution, in the sense of a constitution where there isn't any one single person, there isn't any one single assembly even, that is in total control of the law, rather power is distributed in different, in different centers. So for example, in Rome, there were actually different the Senate obviously was different from the People's Assemblies, and there were at least three People's Assemblies which served either to make laws, and all laws had to be made by them, or to elect those who went to office. You had similar sorts of structures, though varied in different ways, in the northern Italian cities. So they saw themselves as very strongly in the Roman mold. 
And the word republic, of course, was naturally came to be used. And those living in such a northern Italian city would have looked to papal Rome, for example, or looked to France and Paris, and seen, as they would have seen it, people who have to, you know, bow and scrape, as we say in English, to the power of their lives, the Pope in one case, the King in another, have to pay court. Whereas they, being equals, now we're talking just about the citizens, of course, in these cities, could look one another in the eye, walk tall, protected, each of them equally under the law, and under a law that they equally participated in controlling and shaping. They had the two dimensions of freedom, the public and the private dimension. They suffered neither private, ideally, domination or dominatio, since other people that were protected, nor did they suffer public domination because they shared in controlling the law. It wasn't, it wasn't made law at the will of any one individual or any elite uh, in relation to them. Now, in this, uh, this medieval tradition, of course, spreads across Europe, partly because so many get educated, um, I mean, of the um, well-to-do citizens go to northern Italy uh, to be educated. They return, for example, to Poland. You get the Republic of the Nobles in the 1500s. You get the Dutch Republic. Um, you get, of course, the English Republic in the 1650s. Remember, there's a, the king is uh, executed in 1647. You get a rather sad republic in a way in that 10 years in England. And of course, the monarchy is restored in 1660. But in 1688, and the ideas from the Republican period arguably remain quite alive in England, in 1688 the king is essentially expelled, James II, and a king and queen, William and Mary from Holland, are invited in, and they get to be seen as not above the law, making the law as they wish, but themselves under the law. And in fact, the Act of Settlement and so on in the early 18th century in England encodes a lot of these uh, Republican ideas. So you find in 18th century England, you find a celebration of the idea, well, in the words of that old jingoistic song, jingoistic to Irish ears in any case, uh, Britons never, never shall be slaves. You know, slaves are the opposite. Even slaves are the kindly master, are not free. Britons, by contrast, are free in this very, very special way. You get that celebration, and you also get the idea that though there is a king, it's a constitutional monarchy, and the citizens, now it has to be, um, who is the citizen? It's a big issue of this period, but the citizens and uh, those who think of themselves certainly as full members of the society, they're all male, of course, they, one way or another, so it's said or suggested, have great control over what the law is. In good part, they talk about the people's law of this period of Britain because the law is in great part made by, by the common law courts. And the courts that make the law, shape the common law, as it comes to be called, are not controlled by either Technically, they can be controlled by Parliament, but in fact, they're not, and they're certainly not controlled by a king, so that the law is growing up as a result of precedent and the operation of these um, common law courts, as they're called. Now, this image um, in, of what the state can do for you becomes very dominant, as far as I can see, in 18th century England. So the state, the state, the good state, Britain, and the British Constitution, that's a phrase that gets to be used widely in this period. What it does for its people, for its citizens, is that it protects them adequately enough that they can walk tall. For example, you find phrases like that in Milton in the 16, late 1650s, where he talks about what is it to belong to a republic. And he says it is to not have to bow and scrape, you know, to be able to walk tall and know you are equal that remains a powerful idea. And what also remains a powerful idea is that the law that's imposed on us is not the law of somebody else's making, it's a law of our own making. So you get the two dimensions of the, this continual tradition of the Roman idea of freedom. 
And it's recognized, I should say, as Roman in origin. So for example, Thomas Hobbes, who is a great opponent of the Republican way of thinking in the 17th century, in a very famous phrase, he says, of the learning of the ancients, which he thinks his contemporaries have learned Republican ideas from, he means the reading of Polybius, the reading of Cicero, the reading of Livy, he says, never was ancient learning so dearly, so expensively bought, meaning that he thinks it's a disaster, being anti-Republican, being an absolutist, and is suggesting, that but we, what my compatriots, or the English, or the British, have learned from this ancient tradition is really undermining what his view about what the good polity would be, an absolutist, monarchical, well, usually monarchical regime. In the early 1800s, though, while these ideas have been described by Quintus Skinner, for example, as almost a lingua franca of politics in the period, a politics that now, of course, includes North America, well, much of North America, the 13 British colonies in North America, um, as well as uh, Britain itself. Um, this, uh, these ideas, they do go into different camps. So you get more radical Republican ideas and more conservative Republican ideas. And the, the three ideas, if I can just put it at this point, that are being handed on, that are part of the tradition, um, are first of all the notion of freedom, and I've concentrated on that, the notion of freedom as non-domination, you're neither privately dominated nor publicly dominated, the two-dimensional notion of freedom of a person. That's the first idea. Second idea is you need a mixed constitution, spreading power around different hands so that they will check one another in order to um, have uh, institutions that will ensure that sort of freedom. And the third idea, it's actually implicit in most readings of the mixed constitution, is that the people have got to be active in maintaining that constitution. They've got to be alert to possible abuses in government. One of the old recurrent threads is that power corrupts, every form of power corrupts. So when you've got people in office, you've got to work at keeping them virtuous. You've got to exercise vigilance. Actually, it was an Irishman later in the 18th century, John Philpott Curran, who coins the phrase, well, as it comes to be known, it's widely attributed to, um, um, to, to Jefferson, uh, the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. You know, you only get that. You know, these ideas, they assume both a radical and a conservative form. On the radical side, you get, for example, the rise of uh, the group associated with Cato's letters, which we have in that period. And I have here a definition of freedom uh, from Cato's letters, where uh, they, he says, the authors say, liberty is to live upon your own terms. Slavery is to live at the mercy of another. I notice the contrast is between liberty, which is the property of a person, versus slavery, which is the property of a person. First thing to notice. The other thing to notice is that liberty is to live on your own terms. You might say that's almost a direct translation of the Latin to be sui juris to be of your own jurisdiction, right? And that's essentially what they've argued freedom is. Now they use this notion in quite radical critiques of what's happening around them, even what's happening around them under a government, a Whig government, that endorses the same sorts of ideas. This, by the way, is also the period, the 1730s, when uh, Montesquieu comes to Britain, uh, and later in the Spirit of the Laws describes, it's pretty clear he's thinking of Britain, he describes it as a republic hidden in the form of a monarchy. So he's very, very clear that in his vision, Britain is really approaching the status of a republic. Now these ideas spread rapidly to the American side, they're very much part of the tradition. And they are, I would say, and I think most people would say, at the origin of the American War of Independence, the American Revolt. Just to emphasize that, 1766, the, Ameri the British government, they withdraw the Stamp Act. The Stamp Act was an act 
under which the home government, the Westminster Parliament, imposed a tax on its American colonists, who up to then had been taxing themselves for their own colonial government, but had not been paying taxes, at least directly, to Britain. The Stamp Act had reduced taxes of that kind. There's a great critique of this, I mean, a great reaction, negative reaction, complaints, criticism in America in about 1765 when it's brought in. And then in 1766, the Westminster Parliament, and it seems like a really nice thing to do, it says, okay, we're going to withdraw the Stamp Act. We're going to um, take it off the books, so you're not going to be taxed anymore. Size of relief, you might think, across the colonies, except they add one thing, which is really, really gets out of the skin of the Americans. I'm not going to comment on the fact that in America you really had real slavery. That's another issue. Uh, we're just talking about those who would have seen themselves as citizens. They'd have called themselves subjects, of course, to being a king. We're talking about those who have seen, we would see as citizens of those colonies. What the Westminster Parliament do in removing the Stamp Act, they add what's known as the Declaratory Act. I think I have some quotations from it here, in which they assert the right and authority to introduce this sort of tax should they wish. Now you see what's happening. Think like a Republican. Think like how you would have thought in those, in that period. If you're on the American side, you share in the idea of what freedom is, not to be under anyone else's will, um, and you share in the idea that the fact that your master, if you have a master, is a nice master, and that doesn't make you free, you've got to have no master. And now what is the British government telling them? It's saying to them, look, we're being nice to you, we're removing the Stamp Act, but we're asserting our right to reintroduce it if we wish. And that's to say, we are the boss, we are the master. It just happens we're being very nice to you. But now in terms of the received ideas, that's really like putting a a match to the powder keg. And it causes, as you can imagine, a massive reaction. I actually have the American, the defense of the Americans uh, against this sort of, as they would see an assertion of mastery by the uh, Westminster Parliament. The defense of the Americans is taken in good part by two, by English men, uh, and two prominent amongst them are Richard Price, well known as a mathematician independently, and Joseph Priestley, who was actually a famous chemist. I mean, he was the one who discovered oxygen. Um, and for example, I have a quotation, I think, on my handout from Price, 1776. He writes that individuals and communities that have masters over them cannot be denominated free. And now he adds, however equitably and kindly they may be treated. It's exactly that gentle master theme. So he's saying the Americans cannot see themselves as free, even though the Stamp Act has been removed, for example, because th this government is claiming the right to. Joseph Priestley, in a similar uh, sort of speech about that period, says, what are the Americans complaining about? He says, it's not that we're taxing them for one penny. And there was another tax uh, in place called a citric tax, I think. but in any case, it's not that we're taxing them for one penny, it's that we're claiming the right to tax them for the last penny. It's we're asserting mastery. Now, you can think of the American revolt, the War of Independence, as very much inspired by those Republican ideas that in order for these colonies to become free, they have got to do two things. First of all, they have to have a law that makes them individually free protecting them against private domination. But equally, they have to share with fellow citizens equally in making the law that determines the range and the height of protection that they enjoy. And that includes, of course, they have to be makers of the law that determines what taxation they are to pay. And that really is at least one of the main strands of inspiration behind the American Revolution. So that's really all I have to say by way of the history of a republic of thought. But I hope it makes at least, for example, these signal themes, makes, gives prominence to them. And now I want you to think about what happens on the other side. Now Hobbes had opposed 
Republican liberty and are given an alternative definition of liberty back in the 1640s. But Hobbes' ideas, as far as I can see, never really caught on. And so it's still the case at the time of the American Revolt that these ideas are really the central ideas. Nobody thinks about freedom otherwise. It's about the status of a person, and it's the status of someone who is undominated, protected against private domination by the law, a law that itself does not publicly dominate those who live under it. But now, in 1776, a, someone you'll never have heard of, someone I haven't heard of others, and stumbling on this document, someone called John Lind, um, is actually hired by the government in Britain to defend the British against these American complaints, and in particular against Richard Price. So he writes a pamphlet called Three Letters to Dr. Price. And the document by Lynn is quite extraordinary because it suddenly introduces whole new ways of thinking about freedom, and in particular thinking about the relationship between freedom and law. So here's how he argues in that little pamphlet. But it's a very nice argument. I mean, you may reject it, but it's, it's a well-structured argument. He says, what is freedom? And then he says, freedom is just not to be restrained or constrained. Now that's so different from the existing way of thinking, right? It's focusing, first of all, on choice, not on a person. And it's saying, you've got freedom, freedom in choice. As far as no one constrains you, no one restrains you. That's the first claim. Second claim, well, if that's what freedom is, then notice, law always takes from your freedom. Now, it may do more good than harm by protecting you against the interference of other people, but it itself interferes because it coerces you. This way of thinking, interference may be actually blocking you to do something or penalizing you or threatening to penalize you for doing something. The law threatens to penalize you. It coerces you. It interferes with you. And that means that law is a two-edged sword. It may do more good than harm in the end, but it's got an edge on the other side too. It takes away from your freedom by virtue of constraining you. Okay, and what then is his next claim? Well, his next claim is, so what is the complaint of these Americans? He says, look, wait a moment, we live under law here in Britain, so we're constrained by the law. Overall, maybe it's for the benefit because we're protected by the law against other private interferers. But you also live under the law, and sure, it constrains you, but it delivers, you know, overall probably more good than harm. In fact, it goes on to say, actually, I gather things are really good in America, that you're much richer and wealthier than we are, and so on, that they're developing the colonies and so on. So, what on earth is your complaint? It's a brilliant sort of defense of the British government. It introduces a new way of thinking about freedom. Freedom is no longer a status of the person who doesn't depend on the will of a master. It's now a property of the choices that just so, so long as you're not constrained or restrained, to that extent, you're free. And the more choices in which you are not constrained or restrained, the freer that you are. Now in that text, in that actual pamphlet, um, if you look at it, it's worth looking at, actually. In that pamphlet, he is a footnote in which he says he thanks a most worthy and ingenious friend for giving him this idea of freedom. That friend had actually complained to him that he, Lind, had been talking about freedom in this way without crediting him, without citing him, you know. You know who the friend was? The friend was Jeremy Bentham, the young Jeremy Bentham who says in a letter to Lind that I invented this way of thinking about freedom. He said six months ago or a year ago or something like that. He's vague about it. But he clearly says it's a kind of invention of mine and I want to be thanked for it, you know? Now this is really interesting. He's telling us this is a new way of thinking about freedom. And it is a new way, and I'll talk about it a little more in a moment. One of the people who is a great and fellow, as you know, Benton sets up the utilitarian movement, which is a reformist, very prominent sort of progressive movement. One of those who works with him in that movement is someone called William Paley. And William Paley is celebrated in Britain right through the 19th century because he's the one 
who invented the watchmaker argument uh, that seemed to reconcile science and religion. Um, science discovered how intricate the watch was. Religion told us where the watch came from. It came from the watchmaker. And so he was much celebrated in Britain. And part of that celebrity was that a work he wrote in 1785 in political philosophy became almost a standard reading for a learned English, British person in the 19th century. In fact, it was put on the syllabus in Cambridge in 1810 as required reading for every student in Cambridge and was only taken off the syllabus in 1925. And in that book, Paley actually says there are more or less two ways of thinking about freedom. There's what he says, the way of thinking about freedom that I have it here somewhere, corresponds to the usage of common discourse as well as the example of many respectable writers. And that's the Republican notion. He has different ways of characterizing, but it's clearly what I've been talking about. And then he says there's another way of thinking about freedom, a new way of thinking about freedom, and that's the idea that freedom just means non-interference, and you're free to the extent to which you avoid interference. And it comes in degrees, and it affects choice mainly. And he says that we ought to prefer this new way of thinking. And he's quite clear that it is new as well. He's aware of it as an, as, as an invention. Now, the, the effect of the Bentham's and uh, Lynn's and um, Paley's support for this idea, particularly Paley and, and Bentham, is that it rapidly gets taken up in public life and displaces, I would say, initially in Britain, and much more slowly in America, displaces the Republican way of thinking about freedom. And there are good reasons why it does that. This is the period, and actually Bentham and Paley are to the fore, in which the notion of the equality of human beings, including across gender and across class, becomes a dominant idea. So that more and more, it's very hard to think that the state should just serve an elite. It becomes, as it were, second nature to political theorists to think the state should serve all its subjects or citizens equally. Now it's also part of the received tradition, of course, that the state should look after the freedom of its citizens. And now notice, suppose the state, say the British state around 1800, said, okay, we look after everybody equally. It's not that you get equal franchise for 70 years more, but in principle, everyone matters equally. And now we should be looking after their freedom. If you understood freedom as non-domination, well, of course, that would mean that women, for example, you'd have to change all of family law, because family law meant that women were essentially slaves of their husbands or their fathers, as you know. You'd equally have to change all of master-servant law, because the existing law made, made servants essentially um, subject to the will of their master, um, so long as they were servants or somewhere for their whole lives. So if you thought the state should promote freedom and not restrict freedom as non-domination and should promote it for all equally, then you're recommending a really radical revolutionary bombshell. I believe that the utilitarians like Paley and Bentham, recognizing this, go, they downsize their ideal of freedom to this notion of non-restraint, non-constraint, um, in order to be able to say that people can enjoy freedom equally. Women and workers, well, that's an issue, except the argument often is, as it emerges now later in the early 1800s, that if you've got a good Christian husband, he's not going to abuse his wife. But that means his wife isn't going to be restrained or constrained by her husband, particularly. But that means, if freedom just means non interference, that the wife is just as free as the husband. Now, of course, in the older way of thinking, that would be crazy because the wife is under the will of the husband. Even if he is gentle, she's still unfree in relation to him. The new way of thinking, that isn't a problem. They can both be equally non interfering. On the master servant line, the argument that you often find is that no owner or master of, say, a big manufacturing uh, plant that are beginning to appear, would find it economically rational to throw his weight around amongst those he employs. 
he wouldn't keep them happy. So if he's rational, he'll actually, you know, deal strictly with them, not threaten them, not blackmail them, not bully them, not harass them. He will respect them. And they will enjoy, again, freedom as non-interference fully. So it also justifies master master um, servant relationships. Finally, of course, it justifies colonialism. That was the original cause for which it was used. The colonialism of Britain in America is okay because England is a gentle master. The laws that it applies are actually pretty decent laws. The fact that it's a different agent from the American colonies, that doesn't matter in this new way of thinking. Whereas in the Republican way of thinking, a foreign master is still a master. And even if he is in prices where it's equitable and kindly, he, they, in the Parliament case, remain a master, and so the Americans remain unfree. So you can see why it gets to be popular. It justifies being an egalitarian, as the utilitarians are, while not having to be too revolutionary. Actually, Paley uh, expresses this very nicely when he gives his reasons for thinking that you should go with a new way of thinking. And what he says, basically, is that the Republican way of thinking, the old way of thinking, um, and I can't find the, the thing here, uh, maybe this is The old way of thinking, he says, it's at the end of page three, he says, the old way of thinking would inflame expectations that can never be gratified and disturb the public intent with complaints which no wisdom or benevolence of government could ever, could ever remove. He's saying it's just too radical. The old way of thinking that corresponds to common discourse of the usage of respectable writers, if you put that in with egalitarianism, then you're going to get too radical, too revolutionary an approach. And as this develops, this idea of freedom as non-interference, it becomes a natural ideal to use if you're defending the market. What it's going to suggest is look at market relationships and this is more and more the case. You move to a city where you are, say, a tenant farmer. Uh, you sign or you contract with the owner of the factory to take employment. Um, of course, you may contract for a very poor remuneration and very poor conditions because otherwise you die. These are terrible situations of exploitation. But according to this new way of thinking, no one forced you Okay, your circumstances were hard, but that doesn't mean anyone's interfering. This guy offered you a job and you took it on the terms of the contract. And that meant no matter how badly you were treated within that employment, you were actually totally free in the sense of freedom as non-interference, because you'd signed up to this treatment. Actually, as a result of that, uh, the complaints about the manufacturing industry, it was, I think, Jefferson who described workers in that sort of factory, and he would have thought of Northern England, this is before Engels, but it's a condition that's really worse than any Engels would describe 20 years later. He says often that people who work in such factories are like wages slaves. So the notion of wage slavery is actually introduced within the Republican tradition. I would say that that's another issue, and lots of people here know more about it than I do, that the development of socialism trade unionism, chartism in the 19th century in England is actually a natural development of these republican ideas. Although less and less uh, do they come to talk about freedom. And, um, and the, the, the discourse moved on to institutional measures like ownership of the means of production and so on. Um, and really this new liberalism, classical liberalism as it's rightly called, which hails freedom as non-interference, this becomes the dominant tradition. And it has two effects. One, of course, it argues that the market is really unimpeachable. You can have no complaints about the market. But you can have a lot of complaints about the state, because the law, as we said, always interferes with you. In fact, uh, they're really not so sure even about, uh, certainly not so sure about democracy. Even Paley makes the point that once you think about freedom as non-interference, you should realize and again, I have this at the bottom of page two, that an absolute form of government might be no less free than the purest democracy. Because, of course, if freedom is non-interference, 
Maybe you have a benevolent despot who's very nice to everybody, has a good set of laws. Well, you might enjoy less constraint and restraint within that system than you would in a democratic system that imposed more constraints or restraints. So you get a totally different way of viewing things from the older republic. Enough history. Let me just now try to draw it through close in the last uh, um, 10 or 15 minutes by looking to how we should think of neo-republicanism and neo-liberalism. Uh, and I think of each as really a, the natural development of classical republicanism on the one side and classical liberalism on the other. It has to be said that it was really liberalism, classical liberalism, rather than republicanism that was most associated with recognizing the equality of human beings, but not, not only. So for example, Priestley, not pri Priestley, but in particular Price, was a great high priest of the equality of human beings. And so, of course, was Jean-Jacques Rousseau, a particularly French version of the Republican ideas. He also has freedom as non-domination, as Spitz in particular taught me many years ago. Um, but he believes in not the mixed constitution, but the particular participatory assembly that we associate with Rousseau. But on to neo-republicanism and neo-liberalism. Now suppose you feel, as I do and many of us here do, that you know there's a lot of wealth in these ideas, in this long and old tradition, we should try to recover it. So how would you broadly think? Well, you're going to recognize, and I'm putting aside international relations, and I'm putting aside issues about migration, those very important issues, I mean, couldn't be more important to come up concentrate on domestic politics. So if you're thinking about the domestic polity with these ideas in mind, what you're going to ask yourself is, well, wait a moment. First of all, we should be concerned about the relationships that our laws set up between individuals and between individuals and groups of individuals. For example, between individuals and churches and between individuals and corporations, for example. That's the first concern we should have. And you might think of that concern as a concern of social justice. What are we to do in order to make life on that front for citizens um, socially just? And the other thing you're going to worry about is that's the, that's the horizontal non-domination. The other thing you're going to worry about, though, is whether the government, the state apparatus whereby the law is determined, you're going to worry about whether it operates justly in imposing that law on its citizens. That's the issue of what I think of as political justice rather than social justice. Now, if you go the neo-republican way on the social justice front, you're gonna say, what you really want in this tradition is that people should enjoy a defined range of basic liberties, which each law has to set up for its own citizens, and laws, systems of law, differ a lot in the basic liberties they identify. They've got to identify a range of basic liberties, and they've then got to determine what sort of protection should be provided for people in the exercise of those liberties. And on this front, it's obviously going to be important in the Republican way of thinking that in this sphere of the basic liberties, no one is subject to the will of others except that they might, as it were, exercise their will in putting themselves in the hands of another, as we do in friendship and in love and in marriage, for example. Although those relationships we can exit from, ideally, which is an important part. But before we may voluntarily form such relationships, but we should, and this should be a matter of social justice, we should do so from a position of strength in which each of us really has independence from the will of others in the exercise of these choices. And how now are you going to assure that? Well, of course, you're going to have to have a criminal code that protects all of us against the uh, breaches of the basic liberties, and that's going to be associated with criminalizing certain activities and then protecting against them. But you're also going to have systems of social security that protect people against the effects of poverty, because if you are destitute, 
and just should needing of your next meal, then you're going to be subject to the will of others. You're going to depend on the benevolence of anthropy of others. So you need a system of social security. You need a system of contractual security that secures you in relationship, say, to employers. Let me just take an example. In the 19th century, it was said, that's what uh, someone like Jefferson would have been thinking of when he described industrial workers as uh, wage slaves. It was the case that if I, an employer, fired you, I could blacklist you so no one else would employ you, which meant that you were really wholly dependent on my will to keep you on, and I could fire you at will. Now look at what's happened in industrial relations, in workplace relations in the United States. In most places, you can fire a worker at will. In many cases, workplace contracts involve a non-compete clause. A non-compete clause means that you can't leave my employment in my industry and take up similar employment with somebody else in that industry within two years. Lots of people sign up to those non-compete clauses without realizing they're doing it. Of course, it means they now are over a barrel. The employer has them over a barrel because they cannot move often in a way that might want to. Third thing that's happened is we've introduced arbitration clauses into employment contracts, which means that um, if you sign a contract that has an arbitration clause, you can't take your employer to the court for abuse, for example, of various sorts, as you could, for example, I'm sure, in the Czech Republic, you certainly can in Germany or Britain or Australia or Canada, uh, because you've signed up this clause, which means you've got to go one by one to an arbitration panel, um, and you can't have a class action with other workers against an employer. Of course, anyhow, it goes on and on. Now, you need, obviously, workplace security. You need contractual security there against that sort of thing. You need contractual security in marriage, of course, too. Um, you need judicial security. So if you could be taken to court without having proper legal defense, then to that extent you're not secure. You are going to be exposed or likely to be exposed to the will of another person, say a corporation which has real financial power and judicial legal power. And you're really going to be um, dominated exposed to domination in particular by those other entities. So you need on the social justice side a whole range of, of securities. On the political justice side, I'm approaching 55 minutes by my count. Is that right? It's two or three more minutes, okay? That's okay. Um, on the political justice side, if you are thinking in the Republican mode, you're obviously going to really worry that we have a system under which the people share equally in exercising decent control over their government. So any sort of system where the rich have particular control over government, that's going to be really worrying, for example. Any system, of course, where the electoral uh, system is in many, many ways warped, like the districts are drawn to suit one or another party, or where it's hard to vote, or where proving that you're worthy of voting is difficult if you're poor, those are terrible abuses of political justice. You're going to want democratic security. And that requires, I would say, a whole panoply of mixed constitutional rights that include, of course, the rights of contestation as well as the right of voting in elections. And that require that government, those elected power, are subject to an independent judiciary and subject to independent authorities, um, like, for example, an auditor, and have to put up with independent authorities like a Bureau of Statistics uh, or a source of economic data. Government can't control those things, or we can't control government. We won't have the information. It's going to be enormously important. Now, suppose you're a neo-libertarian, a neo-liberal. Suppose you want to build a political philosophy that's constructed out of the elements of the classical liberal opposition to classical Republican ideas. Well, what about the social justice front? Well, there I would say you're going to recognize, of course, that we have to have a basic system of uh, criminal security. You've got to have a law and order at a basic level. 
How much more should you have? Well, of course, you certainly have to have some safety net, I guess, because otherwise you're likely to have civil disorder and the breakdown of law and order. But if you're a neo libertarian, a neo liberal, you're obviously going to think that, well, you know, any laws all take away from freedom, as I understand that freedom is non interference. So you're going to want to minimize the state and minimize what the state does by way of social justice for its people. So it's going to be a direct contrast with the neo Republican way of what the state should do in social justice for its people in guiding their relations with one another and with bodies like corporations within their ranks. What about the democratic side, political justice? Now here's the really striking thing. Neoliberals have almost nothing to say about democracy. And go back to Paley when he said, you know, freedom has very little to do with democracy and you might enjoy more of it, he says, under a despotism, a benevolent despotism, as it would have been called in his time, like the rule of Frederick the Great. It doesn't matter that it's a despot if he or she is benevolent and establishes good laws. What's the worry if you think freedom is just not interference? If you think it's not a nomination, then of course you think it's a, it's a real worry. Now it's very striking, for example, that China has embraced neoliberalism because it's the one philosophy, it absolutely uh, supports the market, the free range of the market, the unconstrained range of market relationships, because they also involve a contract. Never mind that people sign up the contracts that actually dominate them. They may not be necessarily interfered with if they've got a nice master and so on. But it says nothing, neoliberalism, about democracy. Now, most neoliberalism, I hasten to say, neoliberals, embrace an idea, a separate idea of democracy. But it's got nothing in their view to do with freedom. Even Isaiah Berlin, you know, who's certainly not a neoliberal, but has a notion of freedom that is very close to freedom as non-interference. Even Isaiah Berlin, in that famous essay, Two Concepts of Liberty, says two or three times in that essay, freedom has nothing to do with democracy. It's a separate ideal. Now, once it becomes a separate ideal, democracy, that's really sort of worrying, because your political philosophy is riding on two horses, you know? One is this uh, uh, neoliberal idea of freedom, dictating the theory of social justice, where you've got almost nothing to say about political justice, because you can recognize that, well, maybe a regime like the Chinese regime could actually do more for freedom. It could actually be, as a matter of fact, it doesn't, but it might, in principle, do more for freedom. It just holds on to power. I would say, actually, China has this neoliberalism with Chinese characteristics, rather than, as they say, socialism with Chinese characteristics. Actually, I can't resist saying this, that where neoliberalism represents the very antithesis of neo-republicanism on issues of social justice, the very antithesis of neo-republicanism on issues of political justice, where it requires a full-fledged democracy, is neo-populism. Because neo-populism, which I learned today to be called Caesarism, um, where yeah, it does not matter, Ian, uh, is somewhere here, and he spoke about it today. Um, Neo-populism, it basically says, look, all it's about, the people controlling, is that we elect the leader, and none of this court stuff, they're just a nuisance, none of this NGO stuff contesting, they're just a nuisance, none of these independent sort of statutory authorities, just us, we are the real people. That is the very antithesis of the, again, the neo-republican ideal of democratic uh, political justice because uh, it doesn't give you democratic security. So this is my hope. That's the best I can do while we are setting up these two philosophies. I think each has a, a long history. The neo Republican has a very long history indeed. I think, the neo, I think it should be clear at this point where my sympathies lie. The neo Republican gives you a rich theory of social justice and on the same basis a rich theory of democratic justice. Although it has to be worked out. I mean, I hasten to say, Neo republicanism is not a blueprint. I always say it's a research program, you know, in which all many of us here are involved. Because we really have to work hard at working out the uh, best means of securing social justice and, of course, above all, political justice. 
That's really the, the topic of the moment. And on the other side, you have a, a neoliberal agenda, which says very little about anything, really, about except that let the market rip, you know, as far as social justice is concerned. And really, in itself, there's nothing to say about political justice. I hope it can be clear to you which I think is the winner of this debate. <laughs> Thank you very much. classical liberalism and neoliberalism. And what I've described, I think, answers to both classical liberalism and neoliberalism. But liberalism more and more, say, in the late 19th century, in the work of Green and people like that, and of course, John Stuart Mill, um, and they called it at the time modern liberalism, that's the late 19th century phrase in England, and that's a very different. Um, it's got injections of romanticism, for example, coming from, from Humboldt, in Germany and the Romantic tradition. It's also expansive in a whole range of other fronts. It becomes unrecognizable, really. In fact, um, even when it comes to something like freedom, Mill, some, James John Stuart Mill, sometimes is clear that it's something like non-interference. But at other times, it gets awfully close to non-domination in his writing. So for example, in writing about the subjection of women, he is really working, and I think he moves between idioms. So he restores, in some ways, a lot of the a lot of the Republican idiom. Now, American liberalism. I'm very happy to say I'm a liberal. When you know, it's understood we're talking about liberal in an American context, because liberal in American context means a sort of left liberal, as you might put it, and something more like the modern liberalism. So someone like John Rawls, when he describes himself as a liberal, a political liberal, for example, um, that's something that's much nearer the sort of thing that I would embrace. I just hate to say the following. In political theory, it's one thing to have a set of policies. It's another thing to have principles from which you generate the policies. Now, political philosophy is the generative source of principles. So every political philosophy has got two characteristics, two signature aspects. One is, what is the base on which it's generating these uh, uh, policies? And the other is, what are the sorts of policies that it supports? Now, the sorts of policies that, as I see it, though I keep having my mind changed on it, matters of detail, there are lots of people working on this, and I'm you know, really thrilled that much work is being done by various people in broadly, and it's not my tradition, but in the tradition of Republican thought, 
they're coming up with policies all the time. But the thing about, if you take the policies, say, that I am attracted to as a neo Republican, uh, they're really very close in many respects to the sorts of policies that John Rawls would have defended on the basis of his two principles of justice, for example. On the other hand, Rawls has really and I know I'll get into trouble for saying this, but I don't think, I can't find anything that I would describe as a proper theory of democracy in Rawls, a theory of political justice. I mean, he's got stuff about the political liberties, for example, in the early book, and he's got a lot about the liberal theory of legitimacy in the later book. That seems to me to be not really a major shift. He's really concerned with social justice rather than political justice. Political justice gets short shrift as we say in English, uh, from Rawls. That's my sense. And on matters of social justice, I think that the neo Republican is going to find the Rawlsian approach quite sympathetic. Now, as a matter of fact, I don't think the difference principle is operational or is probably a good policy that you could operationalize. So I distance myself from many of these aspects of Rawlsian. But I think, in general, left liberals, American liberals, will often agree on at least social justice policies when it comes to, uh, when it comes to policies. But even if we agree in that respect, um, there are other differences. One is that it's not clear to me how far it's a theory of democracy as well as a theory of social justice, a theory of political justice, liberalism. But also, it hasn't got the same generative source. Now, what is the generative source in Rawls? Well, actually, he goes back to Kant. And you know, there's a, there's a whole school of German scholarship at the moment on Kantian republicanism. And you know, Dorothea Gattaca, who's here, is a good exemplar of it, which I think is recovering in Kant how deeply republican he was. For example, in his very conception of freedom, when you read, for example, the discourse of right in light of you know, the sort of work going on at the moment, you recognize it straight away. But he actually goes to Kant, but a, a moral, well, no, Kant on legitimacy, when Kant says, look, we should be happy with any set of policies that we would have been able to vote on, sorry, to accept in the original contract. And that's the guiding idea in Rawls. Now, he calls it a liberal idea, but I think that's not really identifying the philosophy of liberalism. It's just saying, that's where I am in American politics, I'm on the liberal side. Okay. I'll just stop there. There are lots of other people yeah. wanting to speak, so. Okay, over there. Yes. Okay, three questions together. Yeah. Okay. I'm really not following, I'm terribly sorry. Oh, sure, I'm getting closer. My name is Karl Klose, I am from Germany and studying at the Faculty of Social Science during my doctorate. I have a question regarding the difference between neo republicanism and republicanism in the ancient times, because in Rome, one of the cornerstones of the political system was uh, virtue. Because we're still virtues. Virtue. Uh, virtue. Hmm? Virtue. Virtues. 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 Oh, yeah. Okay. Because Good. Um, you had a set of ideals and ethics how people should behave in the Roman Republic. And when you look now at the neoliberal system, you don't have this kind of virtues or ethics. You basically go for the market based approach, the rational utilizer, maximal, uh, maximizer, maximizer, and so on. And I wanted to ask you. What would a set of ethics and virtues look like in a neo republican fashion? And I would suggest that we take two more questions and then we'll answer all three in one package. So over there and there. We can go there. Yes, yes. Uh, Philip, um, to Question, brief question, one conceptual and one is the uh, Nicholas Vassalis, I teach philosophy at Leiden University. The conceptual question is this. There seems to be 
an invalid inference or something like an invalid inference from the claim, from the classical Republican claim or from claims about negative liberty to the minimal state. As you know, Berlin was an advocate of negative liberty, but he was a lifetime social democrat. Uh, John Stuart Mill was an advocate of negative liberty, but he opposed the subjection of women. So the claims that you made against the classical liberal view just don't seem to lead to the conclusions you claim they lead to. That's the conceptual question. The historical question is, the narrative that has been provided is just too, too good, too good to be true about the opposition between neo-republicanism on the one hand and neoliberalism on the other. And here it is of signal importance, it seems to me at least, that Hayek, for example, who is a paradigmatic, archetypical neoliberal, thinks of himself as a republican. And you know very well that people like Hume and Smith took themselves to be republicans partly in virtue of their commitment to something like uh, a minimal state and uh, uh, a strong and powerful set of market relations that would, or on the ground of non-domination, constrain uh, states. So neoliberalism and neo uh, republicanism don't really seem to be as opposed as to make the case. That's a good question. That's um, the back. Right here. That, uh, it's very hard to hear people from uh, the back. Um, Jesus. It's better from the University of Congo Power in Barcelona. Um, we, we live in a world in which the private powers that threaten to, to dominate us are growing in scale while democracy works in, a, in, the, in the scale of the nation, of the state nation, the nation state. Uh, since the idea of a kind of world democracy is not, uh, well, at least it, it doesn't seem it will happen in the foreseeable future, um, the only way in which states can control these private powers is to delegate power into global political powers which are not subject to democratic control, like the the IMF or, uh, or the World Bank or um, even the European Union is not uh, world democratic. Uh, so it seems that in order to protect us from private domination, we fall into public domination. And this is even worse if you consider that the IMF or the European Union seems to be uh, subject to the pressure of this very global private power. So have you reflected on how can we articulate uh, this uh, public protection of our freedom without losing uh, democracy. Thank you. Okay, th thank you for those uh, questions. So, on the role of virtue in this way of thinking, I think actually that Montesquieu did us a disservice. Remember, Montesquieu distinguished between three sorts of regimes. He said in the Republic, it's governed by virtue and it has to be small. And he says in, the, um, um, in a moderate monarchy, it's controlled by a sense of honor. And in a despotism, it's controlled by fear. Now, I think that, I don't know what, as it were, whether, whether I should be Straussian about interpreting Montesquieu on this. But the fact that he calls Britain a monarchy, a republic hidden in the form of a monarchy, when Britain is a very large country, not at all small, suggests to me that he really didn't mean that you could only get a republic in terms of virtue. Um, what he, now, why he said that, I don't know. But I think in any case, the association between republics and virtue is often overblown. It's true that Cicero, you know, hails virtues in great part, um, but when you move to Machiavelli, for example, even Machiavelli of the discourses on Libby's histories, uh, Morals are important, but they are supported by laws, as he puts it. And when you look at most of the tradition, they emphasize that you can't always depend on the virtue of people, and you shouldn't presuppose that their virtue is too much. You should try to push them towards being virtuous by basically holding them to account. And you can expect them to be virtuous often 
as a result of they'll want to be thought well of, what I call the economy of esteem, is really hailed all the time in this tradition. Um, I have a book with an economist called The Economy of Esteem, and we have a long set of quotations from many of the Republican authors, where it's clear what they're looking for is virtue in public life, but they don't mean spontaneous virtue of these you know, heroic individuals. They mean the virtue that the vigilance of citizens in interrogating and invigilating those in power can actually elicit. So I think that the virtue thing can be overdone. I mean, the more virtue you have, the better. But you should economize on virtue in designing institutions. And I think in the broad Republican tradition, you get many writers who would uh, take that same line. I mean, I'm, I, I think I'm drawing on them rather than putting forward a new line. On the, um, on the issues that uh, Nicholas raised, I may not have heard you properly. It really is the, my ears aren't good with these echoes, I have to say, and whether others are better. But um, I think that, I mean, it's important to me what Paley says, that he thinks, you know, this way of thinking about freedom says nothing about government. It's important to me what Berlin says, when he says that, again, democracy is a different ideal from the idea of freedom. And that's what I'm putting my finger on in saying that just going with this idea of freedom as non-interference would not actually push you to thinking that democracy is a better system than a system in which, you know, temporarily or permanently rule is given over to an elite or an individual or, or whatever it might be. Better than, well, for example, Daniel Bell has defended the China model, an idealized version of China in that recent book. I think he might well feel that people would likely enjoy more freedom as non-interference under that system, a meritocratic system, where only you know the tried and tested for both virtue and expertise are in power. Now, um, I was emphasizing that and saying that, um, that they're distinct. That's quite consistent with thinking that someone like John Stuart Mill, that democracy should have been as important to it, as of course it was, as uh, anything concerning market relationships. So as you say, he's a social democrat of sorts, we might call him. And Mill himself, of course, thinks that both of these values derive from utility, because for him, that's the basic thing. And so they are connected for him, but they're connected not via freedom, but via utility. And I think with you know, someone like Isaiah Berlin, who was a great defender of democracy, it's just he wanted to say, that's a, a separate, it's a separate shtick, you know, it's a separate sort of horse I'm riding. Uh, and most people who are certainly American liberals are all going to be pro-democracy, although their own theory doesn't give them a view about what the institutions of democracy should be. That's my worry. And that's what really worries me at the moment with the move to Caesarist um, democracies in you know, uh, Hungary, Russia, Turkey, Poland. I hope not Czechoslovakia. But in that move, it's a failure to understand what democracy is about. And on the near republican understanding, it's really important that it's not just electoralism with an electoral dictatorship. It involves many channels along which the people have got control over government. The second point you raised about the, yes, the, the story I told, I did say at the beginning, it's a potted history. Uh, the people you mentioned are really interesting, like Hayek, I like Chandra Kukathis' book on Hayek. I think what he brings out is that Hayek really was a very, he had two different sort of mindsets and he moved between them. And one was more Kantian and the other was more Humean. And uh, it's sometimes very hard to reconcile the things that Hayek says across different, but I agree with you. There's certainly a strand which is derived from Kant and Kant because Kant stresses, for example, talking about freedom, the Unahengi kind the lack of dependency on the vilku, on the power of choice of others, that that's what external liberty requires in the discourse of right. And that, that's what he's locking onto. And sometimes he does run with that theme. Anyhow, you know, I'm not going to uh, dissect Hayek, but it seems to me there are, you know, as there are in John Stuart Mill, there are different sort of strands there of thought that sometimes pull with and sometimes against each other. Um, Hume and Smith are really interesting, but I better not say anything given the others. And the third question then, the gentleman at the back, um, 
raised about, yes, international agencies like the IMF and so on. Now, I said at the beginning that I wasn't talking about international relations. I mean, I do have a little book, if I can do a bit of advertising, called Just Freedom. Um, I won't tell you the price of the publisher. <laughs> but uh, in that little book, I tried to show that Republican principles can provide not just a theory of social justice and political justice, but also global justice. Um, and I try there to talk about the role of these international agencies. But you, you press a button on something I'd quite like to mention. I actually think that the growth of corporations has really reached extraordinary proportions and that this may, it's not that global warming isn't important, it surely is, it's not that mass you know, uh, ecological refugees which would have are not important, that surely is, but one of the big challenges I think we'll face that hasn't been thematized enough is the challenge of the growing power of corporations. I mean, corporations are now getting bigger and bigger, so you really shouldn't use the word corporation anymore with a group like Apple. It's an enterprise which has got many corporations which swaps money between these agencies, which now under loosened you know, financial regulations can, any of these companies can move their employment base from one country to another. Countries desperately want to have these companies move in because they're the main source of employment. So they've got countries in a race to the bottom, a race to the bottom in lowering corporation tax. I suspect we'll get a race to the bottom in loosening up employment uh, conditions, workplace conditions, for example. Uh, we may even get a, a, a race to the bottom in other respects too. Now, I'm not saying corporations are a force for unalloyed evil. They're certainly not. But they are powerful sources of domination. One of the things that worries me about what's happened with some sort of parallel strands to neo Republican thought, like for example, someone like Nico Kolodny, some of you will know his work, which is marvelous work in many ways, but he wants to say the ideal should be non-subordination, not non-domination. But as he understands, Nicholas may have use of this, as he understands non-subordination, uh, you enjoy it in so far as you've got good social relations with other people. You're not subordinate to them. But it says nothing about our relation to corporations which hire and fire us, which deliver the goods that we buy and sell, uh, deliver the goods that we buy to us, which establish our communities and employment in the communities and shape the communities. These are corporations which more and more are beyond the control of the law because they've got such power over the lawmakers and over even communities. There's an awful lot more to say about that issue, and, uh, and I should uh, bite my tongue, which I hereby do, but uh, I think those international challenges are enormous, and that third space of global justice is of extraordinary importance, and you know, I've just said nothing about it today. Okay. So, um, well, we'll ask Thanks, and thanks to the organizers as well. It's a great comment. Um, my question, maybe it's, it's simple, I'm not sure. Every time you speak of domination, you speak as though, and I think specifically that, there has to be an agent that's doing the dominant. Now, Agents, uh, yes. Right, so there, if, if I'm correct, for you, agents always have to be doing the domination. Now, it seems to me that there are some modern, postmodern problems that could be construed as agent list problems. And I was wondering how neo Republicanism could um, respond to that. So, for example, surveillance. Right? The problem of surveillance, domination, um, it, it could be construed as having agents involved in it. But the agents don't really matter, right? You could blow up the NSA, or you could stop one surveillance power, but it wouldn't address the domination at all because the network is so robust as to make individual agents um, a non matter. So I was wondering if, if neo Republicanism, you know, you've established the ancient foundations of this program, but can it be updated? Well, two, two, two things, uh, if I may. 
One is, I think, that another really major threat today is coming via social media and via the fact that we've got political messages being targeted. You know, with, I mean, nowadays with the big data available from, you know, what emails you send, what you download, what you do on Facebook, if you do anything, what you do on Twitter, what books you buy on Kindle, you know, or on whatever. All of these create a digital footprint. And with the big algorithms, it's now possible to target someone. In fact, I heard someone recently at a conference in Cambridge, a psychologist, say, you know, this data enables us to establish the personality type of an individual more than any traditional interview data of a psychologist would have done. Now, that means that these companies have got available to them, and Cambridge Analytica, that company in particular, use this information in Brexit, as we know, and in the Trump election. In each case, on the side I wasn't on, guess what that is. Um, they use this information in order to send out the sort of news, always without a signature, so you don't know who it's coming from, that is bound to target you. So we know that in America, liberals, for example, were targeted by Cambridge Analytica with messages if they were identified as someone who was likely um, to become disengaged, they were targeted with messages as they're both crooks, you know, Hillary is as bad as, you know, Trump is, blah, blah, to get them not to vote. Where Republicans, again based on the profile, if that was appropriate, were targeted with messages as you're going to be overrun with immigrants, you know, they're going to destroy our country, to get them out to vote, you know. Now that sort of power, especially a power I mean, traditionally, we required political parties to say who endorsed this message, you know, when a message goes out on television or radio. There's no requirement of signature on the social media. And so we've no check even if they're saying consistent things to different targeted audiences. Now, that's an enormous degree of control. I mean, I wrote a little op-ed for one website recently on this. I think that the, in the social media world, we are subject to a potential domination. Uh, which is extraordinary. I mean, the critique of what's happening is often done in terms of privacy, that these people can see into our lives and our choices, you know, what we're downloading and so on. Um, and the argument is that it's a breach of privacy. Well, you know, someone who doesn't have power could breach your privacy. They just happen to, you know, know what you're doing. They can't do anything about it, they're powerless, but they still breach your privacy. These people don't just breach privacy, they compromise your freedom understood in non-domination terms, because they now have a mastery of power over you. And we've allowed that happen. We have to build laws that will catch up with that. That's the one thing I want to say. The other is that structural domination, as I understand it, it's not quite why everybody understands it, but how I, why I, how I understand it, is really the most important thing in society. But here's how I understand it. Structural domination is what you have when you have, for example, uh, relations or norms, for example, in the society, say sexist norms, um, which mean that the norms don't dominate. In that sense, I think domination is always done by individuals or by corporate agents, by agents against individuals. Um, but these norms can facilitate domination. You know, they can make it very likely, they can make it almost inevitable uh, that some people can dominate others. Now, when the structure, so it's a structure for, uh, pre-structure for, facilitate, maybe necessitate even, program for, domination of some by others, whether it be across gender, across class, across ethnic divide or whatever, that's, that's really the main source of domination. So even though I think of the main ultimate complaint is that I'm under the will of another person or another corporate body, what puts us in that position will often be the abstract norms of the society or the social structure or the economic structure of the society. So I'm entirely in line with people like, I mean, I applaud, though they distinguish themselves from me. I mean, I'm happy to go with them. Uh, people like Alex Gurevich, for example, you know, writing about these, about these issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.